Hello to our listeners. This session is the second session of the Data Recur Group of the Closure Community. Uh, what we are about is about collaborations between different closure data libraries, part of this emerging ecosystem for data science, data analytics, data processing in closure. And today, we will focus on two projects. Uh, one is Closure Ask and another is Tablecloth. And both of them are about processing tables in different ways. And, and uh, uh, the team of the Closure Ask uh, project was so kind to join this session and also uh, Ethan uh, from the Tablecloth project. And uh, so it, it, we, we can hope for a wonderful discussion. And we will begin by uh, brief introductions. Uh, so anybody is invited to tell a little bit about themselves, if it is okay. And if you prefer not to, it is just fine as well. Um, and, and then uh, maybe uh, we could, uh, you know, do as we like uh, to do, uh, where somebody is presenting themselves and telling, asking another person to present if it works. Then should we do that? Uh, maybe Ethan, would you, would you like to begin? Sure, my name's Ethan Miller. Uh, I've uh, been hanging around with a lot of people from the Cyclos community, this loose community of people interested in data processing and closure and for a while and doing some organizing and helping out on some of the projects that are emerging. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, that's basically about me. Did you want me to pick somebody else to, is that what you were saying, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, that would be beautiful. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Matt, you're to my right on the right. <laughs> yeah, so uh, great, it's great to be here. Thanks a lot for the invitation uh, to, to present here. Uh, so uh, we're from uh, HKU, the University of Hong Kong. Um, so, and uh, I have a little um, team of, of RAs. Uh, so Leo, he is the um, most senior uh, RA, uh, and then there's also Sang Ho, but he couldn't make it today, and um, Oscar also, he's uh, here today. Um, yeah, and so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Clojask and um, and why we wrote it and what it's all about. Yeah, so so should I now um, pass pass on to some someone else, or how does it work? Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah. If you all yeah. right, okay, so I just see um, Marcio, I see that's, that's the next one on my screen. If not, then, then maybe Leo and uh, Oscar, maybe you could just say a few sentences. Yes, um, I'm Leo, but uh, you can call me at the Leo or Yu Chen, yes. Uh, I'm one of the RAs uh, in Dr. Matt's team and uh, I'm also one of the authors of Clojask. So, and and uh, uh, later I will be giving a presentation about Clojask. Thank you, and uh, nice to meet you all. all right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Oscar. I'm also a student at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, sorry about the background. Um, yeah, so nice to meet you all. Uh, sh should I now pass it to someone else? Uh, uh, how about George? Sure. Hello, I'm George. Uh, I've been stuck in the community for a while. I don't really speak or anything because I'm learning so ev everything new. So closure is new to me, sort of kind of. But I work for a financial institution here in the, on the East Coast of the United States. And uh, we did some projects in Clojure, and uh, I just started my journey as a um, in data engineering. So we're building pipelines and stuff like that, and I'm trying to figure out how to bring some more Clojure back into my institution as well as continue to learn. I will pass it on to Abhishek. Thank you, Josh. Uh, so hi, uh, this is my first time joining a Clojure meeting, and. Speaking in it, uh, I'm complete new newbie to Clojure, and I come from the Python world. I've done a little bit of data work there, and recently I had to do a lot of data cleanup, and I started using uh, tablecloth and a bunch of tools around that. So 
So I was just curious to see how I can make my experience better. So that's why I'm here. So I'll take uh, uh, Tovie. I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm. Uh, you got it right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my name is uh, Tovie Ozi. I'm based in Lagos. Actually, no longer Lagos, but uh, a city on the south coast of Nigeria. And uh, I've been off and on with uh, the data science community on uh, Zulip for some time. So I'm just rejoining again, and uh, I'm interested in uh, using Clojure to process large amounts of data. So that, that's a topic that interests me. I work as a Clojure developer. I think I have uh, two years experience working with Clojure at this point. So um, I'll pick um, Adam. Adam, A-D-H-A-M. Yes, the H can then messes things up. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I'm new to the community and Clojure in general. Uh, I come from an R background. I'm, I work with a research firm, usually making dashboards with Shiny. Uh, I'm interested in Clojure because I'm interested in Lisps in general. Uh, I use Emacs all the time and I write Emacs Lisp all the time. So I was like, why not just jump full on into Lisps with the data? So I've been learning Clojure on the side for a while and I'm really, really enjoying it. And this is my first time joining a Clojure meeting. Nice to meet you all. Wonderful. Um, yeah, maybe I'll tell about myself. Uh, I'm Danielle. I am a community organizer in the Cyclodge community, uh, together with Ethan, who is here with us, and a few other friends. And uh, we are involved in trying to build a stack of tools and libraries for data science enclosure. And, and uh, yeah, and uh, Richie, uh, hi, would you, would you tell about yourself? Hey, uh, hi everybody. I'm I'm Richie. I'm I'm based in Austin. Uh, currently doing Clojure full time. Uh, I I use Clojure extensively during my PhD. Uh, love very much. I mean, I like uh, Lisp in general. Uh, so I'm just trying to you know pick up new new things. Uh, many new new people in the community. Yeah, nice to meet you, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, it is so beautiful to meet all the new friends today and really a wonderful group. And um, maybe a general comment is that this new group called Data Rica is mostly a space for the people creating the tools to discuss what they're creating and share it and get some feedback and meet the users and meet other collaborators. Uh, but we have other groups uh, which are more about study, about exploration, and other aspects of the story. And if anybody feels that anything is missing in our sessions, that some other kind of session would be useful for, for them, then please reach out and we'll think about how to make this community uh, friendly for you and useful for you in your journey. Um, anyway, uh, today we we'll have those two presentations about Closure Ask and Tableplot. And we will begin with the closure ask, friends. Uh, any thoughts or comments before we begin? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so um, I'll do a brief, a very brief introduction, and then uh, Leo will take over. Um, so um, basically, closure ask started out. Uh, so we, are, you know, we're in finance. Uh, so I, I'm in finance at least in uh, at um, the HKU Business School. Um, so I deal with a lot of data set, like financial data sets and so on. So some of them are um, pretty large and uh, some of them are like, you know, larger than the, the, the computer memory. And so the idea was to say, okay, like, you know, can't we just uh, have maybe like an, you know, some kind of tool that can handle data sets that are larger than memory and handle it, you know, kind of in an elegant and hopefully easy way. Uh, so of course there are some tools from uh, you know from other um, 
languages out there. So uh, for example, Dask, uh, to mention one of them uh, from, from, the, from the Python world. Uh, and then, but you know, then I was kind of interested in, in Lisps for quite some time. I've been following Clojure uh, for, you know, for, for several years. Um, and uh, then the idea was, you know, let's let's try to uh, do this in in Clojure and uh, and uh, kind of leverage the strength of of the language uh, in this area. And uh, so basically, that's how this whole uh, project uh, started. Um, and um, yeah, so and now I would hand it over to uh, Leo. So Leo is the most senior RA in the team, and he would uh, you know he he's been a, a part of the project from the very beginning. He's he has uh, lots of experience. Um, you know, understanding all the ins and outs of the project, um, all the details. Um, so, so he will uh, he will take over now. Thank you, Leo. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to present and populate our library Clojesk. And uh, if there's no problem, I will start uh, sharing my screen. I have, I have prepared a PPT for this meeting. Uh, is it okay if I share my screen? Yeah, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I will be giving a brief introduction and uh, the design philosophy of Clojesk. Clojesk is uh, some of you may already have used it for a while. It's a parallel data processing framework uh, written in pure closure. Um, and I'm Yu Chen Liu. I'm from I'm uh, one of the RAs from the HKU research team. Nice to meet you. Uh, let me first give an overview of Clojesk. In terms of the functionality of Clojesk, we focus more on the data processing part rather than the data analyzing or data storing ability. Although uh, it can deal with some tasks uh, of data anal analyzing, but all of its designs are optimized for data processing, especially on larger than memory data sets. And uh, I have summarized the features uh, into four points. First, our targets are the huge single data set files. And uh, these files can be of uh, multiple formats, such as the CSV or DAT or Excel, uh, Excel or et cetera. Um, and second, uh, uh, when, uh, when executing the computation, um, we uh, we try to use the minimum memory as we can. So in order to uh, do it, we have two rules. First, operators are imposed on each column. Uh, so basically, if you want to set a type, you can set a type on, on the same column of this uh, data frame. And uh, you can also operate some operations uh, on, on, each data, on each column. And in terms of the real computation, the computation are done on each row. So basically, and, um, and optimally, uh, during the execution, only a few rows of memory will be used because we are only computing on these rows. And for all of the other rows, it won't be in the memory. And we will do the computation each row by row. Yes, like this. And next, let me talk about the architecture of Clojesk. On top is the Clojesk IO input. So Clojesk IO is a standalone library we designed to support, uh, to extend the support of file formats in Clojesk. So using the Clojesk IO input, we, 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 we are able to read in multiple file formats as, as I discussed uh, in the previous page. And under, and under the input is the main Clojesk data frame. So this data frame will contain all the necessary information for a Clojesk data frame. For example, uh, the types of each column or the, you know, the parts of the format of each column and even the um, for example, the operation pipelines for each column, uh, um, something like that. And in the middle is the is Onyx. So Onyx is quite a popular 
um, distributed platform in Clojure, and it has it has a really fascinating design, and we chose this because it really fit our needs. In, in Onyx, uh, it mainly has three components. One is the input node, um, and uh, another is the worker nodes, which can be multiple. And also uh, there is the, an, an output node. And uh, the first layer we talked about, the closed IO input is used to define the logic in input node. So basically how to read, how to, how to uh, for the input node to read in a data set source file. And the closed data frame, all the information in there is used to define the execution logic of each worker nodes. And basically all of the worker nodes here are using the same um, execution function. They are all general purpose. Um, and the, for the output node, we use the closed heap and closed IO output module to define it. And closed uh, closure heap is also an, another another library we uh, our team designed. Uh, it is a heap implementation in pure closure, and it will be used optionally if the user uh, has enforced the order of the output file to be the same of the input file. <clears throat> and and the output uh, the closure SIO output module is used to output the the results into different type of file formats. For example, if the reading file is an Excel file, we can also output our results as an Excel file. Great. Uh, next, let me give a brief walkthrough of all our uh, of uh, all of all of our main APIs, and uh, I like to give a demonstration of it. Make it smaller so that I can so it, so that you can see the uh, the diagram. And basically, when you are using our library, the first thing you need to do is, of course, defining a or initializing a data frame. So it's really easy to do it in ClojS. You can simply, um, yes, so here I have started a line, line general repo, which is uh, good for debug. And actually we have made quite a few um, exclusive functions uh, to, to use Clojask in repo. And I will um, talk about them later. To, um, to define a data frame, uh, I'm already in the closed namespace, so I don't need to require it anymore. So I can just use the closed uh, data frame function. And to, to initialize a data frame, you can just input the path of the data frame. It can either be a local uh, path or a relative path on your local computer or even a URL on the internet. Uh, so now let me... And one of the functions we designed for REPL is the print diff function. It can be used to print the data frame out in a well-formatted data table. And you can see this, it's uh, pretty beautiful in the um, terminal. So you can see that uh, this data frame has uh, four columns and it has multiple rows here. We only show in the top maybe nine rows of it. And, uh, and the next, next step after, after we have already got the uh, data frame is to set different types on each column. By default, each column has the file type a string, right? So, but, but salary should um, intuitively be integer. Therefore, let me set the type of salary to integer. 
because it's quite intuitive. And then after each oper operator, you can use this print diff uh, function to uh, preview the, the uh, most recent uh, format of the data frame. So this function is not like the, the final compute function. This function is used, only used to preview the, the data frame. So it, it will require only a really small portion of the um, computation because it will just pick the top few lines of the data frame. So if you are dealing with the data set start that's, for example, 10 gigabyte, then that will, this function will only um, preview the first 10 rows of it. It won't, uh, you know, <laughs> compute the whole uh, data frame. You can see uh, the latest data frame has changed salary into an integer type. And then uh, let me do some filtering. So this filtering is used to filter all the rows that we don't want. Uh, let me, for example, filter the rows that has salary larger than, um, larger, or, uh, larger than, for example, uh, 1,000. So we can do it like this. Remember I said um, the, operators, the operators are imposed on each column. So for example, here we need also to indicate the column. And then here you need to input a function actually, a function that takes uh, one variable, which can be the salary, because you are imposing this function to each value in this, in this salary column. And, and we want salary to be smaller or equal to a thousand. And then when you preview the data frame, you can see the rows that has salary uh, larger than 3,000 are all gone. Uh, I mean, 1,000 are all gone. Nice. So another thing you can do after filtering is to operate. So this operate can be pipeline. Um, and this operate can be imposed to either a single column or even multiple columns. Let me uh, demonstrate the multi-columns case. Here, let me define a function, and uh, and the next argument should be uh, multiple column names. So, say I want to um, operate uh, operate, or you can say map map a function to two columns: the de the uh, department column and the salary column. So you can do it like this. One one of the main design focus uh, is to make everything really simple. Uh, for example, the installation should be simple and also the way you call the APIs needs to be intuitive. And I hope uh, you can feel it when you use uh, Clojet. Uh, the first argument is the targeted columns and the second one is the new column names. And this is to this this new column is used to host host the result of um you know the this function return. This function needs to have of course two arguments this time. One of it one is the de department and one is the salary. And uh, let me define logic like this. We want to add the salary uh, by uh, increase it by a hundred for all the people in department, for example, 11. Then you can, you can just do it like this. So you need to first check um, if, for example, the department is equal to 11. Uh, keep in mind that the department here is of the string data type. Yes, and you, you need to uh, you know, have a string corresponding to the type. And if the department is equal to 11, we add 
a hundred to salary. Otherwise, we return the previous original salary. And then we can also again print out our data frame. And this this is what our latest data frame looks like. Um all the all the, the um top four columns are unchanged except for this new column. And it has two um data types, uh both integer and long. And you can see uh for the for the rows that has department equal to 11 the salary are changed other rows are unchanged this is exactly what we want um then after we can do some operations we can choose a separate path we can choose either to group by the data frame and then aggregate which is a classic group group ag aggregation uh, function, or you can join multiple data frames together by some columns. Um, and, but the sad thing is that you can only choose either of it. Either you can aggregate and group by, or you can join, because um, we don't need, we don't want to complicate things. Once we have allowed the user to group by aggregate, then, then join, then it can create, you know, endless um, directed uh, acyclic graph and it, it, it will complicate things. So one alternative to, if you want to do both of them is you first compute the intimate result, intermediate result of group aggregate, then read back in this result and file, then do some uh, drawing if you want. And uh, let me demonstrate how to do group aggregate. Here I can group by the data frame by the by the same department, and if we don't aggregate, the result will be the same as to select the distinct uh, department from the data frame, like this, and. Um, and then we, we can also do aggregate, of course. Um, we have the, we have provided a few built-in aggregation functions for the users. So for example, here uh, it is to find the maximum of the group. So we will find the maximum salary in each department group. So it will look like this. And of course, um, whenever you can do a print diff function, you can do a real compute. The real compute is actually to, you know, compute the, the whole data frame, the whole immutable data frame and apply different operate, all of the registered operators on it and give you the, the final result. And the result will be stored in the, in the destination file you define. So as I said, this is a parallel processing framework. Therefore, you can uh, indicate number of workers you, you want. So, so for example, here I can fire up five workers, uh, eight workers, and the targeted file is the can be, for example, output.csv. And then uh just Wait for a minute, because uh, this process need to you know start up the the whole distributed engine and so on. So it will take um, some second, but most of it is the fixed uh, amount of time. And this this fixed amount of time will be neglectable if you are dealing with a huge uh, data data frame. So all your output is in the output.csv file. And continue, we can also join X with other data frames. Um, for example, let me define a Y.
to be um, the department of CFP. And it looks like looks like looks like looks like this. What I'm going to do is to draw a data frame X with data frame Y. If you do it right now, for example, I can inner join or natural natural join X with Y on the two columns. It will tell you that cannot join on a data frame that has already been grouped by or aggregated. As I said, yes, you can choose either of it. Um, and uh, what we can do now is, of course, you uh, read back in the results of this compute and then join it with Y. So what if I just want to join the original X with Y? Then you can re read in the whole or redefine the X. And then try it with Y. That's that's allowed. Then compute. X. Um, so so uh the output of the return value of the joining function is also a closure as data frame. So you need to uh, assign it to another variable. Let me call it C. And then you can compute Z. Let us find the the output here. Is it done? No, it's it's not done. Yeah, it's finished. Then in the output of CSV, you can see the uh, not output of CSV, but uh, drawing dot CSV. Sorry, you can you you can see the exact result we want. We are drawing the uh, um department with the department. Yeah, so that's all I want to demonstrate about the APIs. Do you have any questions or any uh, interested APIs you want to add or even you? some questions uh, you want to ask when you are using Clojesk. You are welcome to just ask at any time. I had a couple of questions, maybe one, maybe two, I don't know. Yeah. It looks beautiful. Uh, um, so that's, that's really nice to see. Um, I think uh, what I was, curious about maybe to begin with is the when when you showed the compute uh, it looked like i might have missed something but it looked like there was a uh, you were you had performed some operations on the data frames and then you computed it which which was kind of like uh writing it out to disk at also but also it was performing a series of operations i guess is the is the data frame then storing um, a list of those operations? Like how did how you know or or was there did I miss something? Like when you did the compute, how did it know what change, what what it was doing or needed to do? Um, I hope I understand you correctly. So you are saying how we store, you know, all those um registered operations is that on the register yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah like uh, yes like for example how how do we remember all of those you know set type or operate or even group by aggregate apis exactly. had used how do we uh, so actually we uh we store it in different ways um but normally speaking we we make use of uh the efficient data structures such as hash map uh, mm -hmm. in, in, um, in closure, in native closure, or for example, the, uh, the vector in native closure. So all of those, um, 
the way we store it in the those structure is for us to um get the those registered operations most efficient in runtime. Um, yes, and is that is that what you are asking? Uh yeah. Or uh, that is it be more detailed detailed? And no, the, yeah, that's what I was wondering. Um, and then is it possible to let's say you like were working on a data frame for a while, doing different things? Um, can you view like a list of those things? As, you know, let's say you forgot. Oh, I don't remember what I was doing or what I did. Oh yeah. So you mean you you want to withdraw some operations uh, or? You know, uh, no, we, we haven't uh, designed, uh, I mean, mechanism for that, but really we are looking forward to add it in the future. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. now we have the this function of um, pre-detect possible data uh, errors before compute. Mm. Uh, let, let me uh, try to, uh, yeah, so here. Let me continue. For example, um, recall the data frame X. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like this. And uh, for example, I change salary into integer again. Mm -hmm. So in case the user do some um, um, you know, uh, a little bit silly things on columns. For example, the the salary is uh is a it should be the integer types, right? But what if he treated it like a string, and right. we we won't be able to notice it be, before we really do the compute. Therefore, there there is uh the and pre detect uh, mechanism in in the in this data frame. So, for example, I will operate. Um, a function, um, for example, I will, um, what, what are the things that, okay, uh, let me do it like this. So what if salary is a string, but the user treated as an integer? I think this, mm -hmm. uh, yes, this is more straightforward. And uh, for example, the user, if it's a string, but the user want to, Added by increase it by one, then uh, it, you will write something like this. Do we allow him to do so? We don't. You can see here, fail, failed in running operation. This function cannot. Um, yeah, so this we have this error pre detect. Um, like this is a quite interesting function we invented for the user to find their their mistakes in yeah. once before they really do the compute because yes uh because as as you can see the the overhead of compute can be a little bit long so it's uh, quite frustrating for them to realize there they had there has some mistakes in their operation diagram uh yeah. only when they compute And is that, let's say, uh, I don't know, the error was related to like a missing value. Yeah, so uh, how you treat missing value is another thing. So actually we are quite tolerant to missing value. Um, let's say, um, for example, this joint. Sweet. Um, so let me, for example, delete a few things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then
uh, of course, uh, at the beginning, it, when when all, all of columns are string, it should be fine because um, you know it it's just a, a an empty string. But after you have set type on it, mm -hmm. the type of this column can be multiple. Um, for example, salary here has a has a, an obvious empty value. We allowed user to set type on a column with empty, empty values, but um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, um, said there's no salary column. Yes, um, should be. Oh, it's not X. Sorry, so it's mm, new. Yeah, <laughs> trying to. Yeah. So you can see um, this the type of this column can either be an integer or a new. So after so afterwards, if you want to operate some operations on this column, you need to be really uh, aware that the input mm -hmm. of the this function can be either an integer or a a, a nail. So yes, mm -hmm. this is something the user needs to um to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. uh, I have so many. Yeah, um, I don't want to. I have uh, other questions too, but I don't want to like. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we can talk about it. The like all of them. Um, after I finish my normal. Oh, sorry. Like, yeah. So especially if you <laughs> didn't realize you were. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm only <laughs> half of my way in the presentation. Sorry about it. Um, By the way, we have a lot of time, so no rush at all. And thank you, that is beautiful. Okay, yeah. Um, maybe I, I will just, you know, finish all my presentation in case maybe some of your questions can be answered in my, you know, later contents. Okay. Um, I believe you you have already got a, a basic understanding of Clojess right now. So let me give a presentation of Clojess with Dask. So Dask is a well-known distributed uh, data frame library in Python. And to design Clojess, we actually uh, learn a lot from Dask. And also we want to do it, do something better than Dask. Um, so in terms of, of the benchmarks, you can see here, uh, for the most simple element wise operations, basically you are just, um, increasing some values in a column or, you know, changing some, some specific values in each column, then, uh, we can do better than task in all, um, in all type of, uh, in, in all types of files, ranging from uh, files that has 1.8 million rows to 80 million rows. So the NA here means that Dask can, can't um, finish the task in the in a quite acceptable amount of time. So I, I'm, I believe this is because Dask is now designed for uh, to deal with files at this uh, size for a relatively, uh, you know, uh, outdated computer, but we can uh, always finish the task before because we are designed for it. Uh, but we we don't do uh, as good as uh, it in all of the tasks. So, for example, the group by aggregate, because task uses the so use that task uses memory strategy to um, load the, almost the, the the whole data frame into memory at a time, so it can do better in, uh, in, in tasks like group by aggregate than us. And uh, their advantage is even of more obvious on larger files. Also for uh, the left join and inner join. But uh, their disadvantage also quite obvious. They can't uh, deal with larger files as good as us. Yes, and you can always find these benchmarks in our website. 
and to compare uh, to compare Clojess with some well-known distributed platforms in other language, for example, Hadoop MapReduce, which is actually kind of the, the first ever distributed platform. Um, we have quite a, a, something in common. For example, both of them support, support larger than memory source files. Both of them will write intermediate results to temporary files in some cases. So Clojess will, will only write intermediate results to, to temporary files in terms of some advanced uh, functions such as joins or group bytes. So we, we have no choice but to um, output to intermediate results because the files could be large and the size of each group can be larger than memory. But Hadoop, I think they they will always write the, the results to uh to the disk memory. And uh, both of the libraries support MapReduce paradigm, but what we support further is uh also the joins, the filters, and also aggregate, etc. on on large files. <clears throat> and but we don't support clusters right now because there are too too many things to consider if uh if involving you know the clusters of multiple machines and uh, but but Hadoop map reduce is designed for that to compare Clojess with Spark um so both of the libraries has this concept of smallest computation unit. In Clojess, we call it the data frame. In Spark, it can either be a RDD or a data frame or even a data set. And both of these smallest computation unit are immutable. And Spark, uh, Spark allows the user to construct this operations directed async graph to pipeline all of the operations uh, in the most optimal way, but we don't uh, support it. So because this is really complicated and uh, it's uh, to, to introduce this feature is really uh, um, difficult for us. And actually it's not like the, the trade-off is not so, so good to, um, I think for, for now, Without the DAG, we can we can still support um, maybe ninety percent of things the user want to do to a to data frame. The user can um, can operate on on column uh, using uh, you know a pipeline operations. That's also okay, uh, but it, it's just that the user can't use the result of a column as the input of another function. Uh, 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 of the input of another um, multiple argument function. Um, and uh, both of CloJS Spark support joins filter aggregates that um, uh, Hadoop MapReduce doesn't support. And you can see here is a kind of like a reversed, um, or you can see, a, you can see a, design trade-off of uh, features. Spark choose, chooses to cache intermediate result uh, between different stages, for example, between group by and aggregate or between the group by and join in memory, but we don't do it. So we will uh, only, we will, we will output those results to intermediate disk files. So the, the strategy we, we choose is the minimum memory usage. And uh, yeah, so this is something uh, for the purpose to, to for the design purpose of the, the, the library. Okay, that's all of the comparisons. And I will also want to mention the outlook of our project.
um, there are a few things we really want to do. Um, and uh, we actually don't have quite a priority for these points. You, you may also stress more. We are, we are really welcome uh, you to do it. So the first thing is to decouple between layers to make the maintaining easier. Uh, remember, we have the four the, the five layers, and uh, and actually currently uh, things between layers are sometimes confusing and uh, they are not so clear. So I would really want to decouple it more clearly, and uh, we we would also want to support cluster or district um the clusters uh in the future. And uh, to solve this task, we need to find the proper distributed file system um, to support this clustering function. Um, for example, Hadoop has Hive as its distributed file system and, and uh, Spark also has its own, but um, actually we are not uh, finding a good distributed file, file system written in pure closure. Yes. and. And we would like also suggestions on that. Third is uh, we will try to support more data analytics functions, especially you know adding more group uh, group uh, I mean aggregation functions. Um, and the fourth is we want to support more file types, uh, for example, uh, Parquet or Afro files, uh, or even we want to support some data database APIs, it's, it will be really good if we can just read uh, data from the database and even output to a, data, to, to a database. And uh, the, the final thing is to make more um, advantage of the Onyx. So the more we use Onyx, the more um, unexploited, unexploited features we find in Onyx. So we would really want to dig deeper into Onyx and uh, make the best of use of it. Yes, I think that's all of my presentation today, but we, we can have some time to do a Q and A. Um, for example, Ethan, we can continue with our discussion, I think. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Liu, uh, and uh, that was so enlightening. Um, by the way, now we have we are half an hour before the official time, and so uh, maybe we could have a few brief questions and answers, and maybe other comments by the Clojask team, and then we could move to Ethan's presentation about tablecloth columns, and then we could have a little more discussion. And maybe a few people would like to stay a little later after the official time. Sometimes we like to stay and chat. But uh, anyway, uh, is it a good plan for now? Yeah, just uh, one quick uh, comment. So I think Leo was, uh, was referring to HDFS for the distributed file system. Yeah, for, for, for Hadoop and Spark and so on. Yeah, and, and thank you for the uh, applause uh, from the audience. And, and uh, uh, yeah, so um, any comments, any questions, uh, anybody? Uh, or should we go about tablecloth and then return to a discussion? Uh, I do have a question. So the parallelization part of it, is that done by the Onyx or? Um, yes, it's entirely it done is. by Onyx. Yes. So is and it automatically? So when I when I do uh request when I do a I mean uh submit a, a computation request and then uh it would basically just do uh parallelize the work based on the resource of the current node. Or you have yes. to specify exactly. Um, uh, you need to specify the execution logic of the node, but to you know firing up and doing some collection work is all done by onyx yes okay awesome.
Yeah, and maybe since we are already uh, here at this slide, uh, could you could you tell just a little bit about the closure heap component and the role of that? And, and uh, would it be good to expand about it a bit? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, okay, let me, I will need to, I can share screen. Uh, as I said, closure heap is kind of like a side project for closures. Uh, this is something we find necessary um, when we, Deal with, you know, enforcing the the seek the order of the output the same as input, and I think we really need a heap or priority queue data structure. But I don't find the the most suit, suitable one in closure, so I implement it on my own. Um, it's uh, also it's also open source on GitHub. Uh, it's also on closures. You can you can use it really easy. Uh, the speed of it is uh, equal to the theoretical limit, but uh, of course there is a constant, uh, constant. Uh, I mean, uh, number in front of the login. But I have tested it. It's not as good as the sorted map native enclosure, but uh, it has, I think, a better interface than the sorted map. Um, so for example, you can define a heap using the comparator function and also the initial value of the heap. And you can, you can have the basic APIs of, of a heap. For example, you can peek the, the, the value at the top. You can add an uh, element to a heap. You can pull or, or you, you can say pop uh, the top element from the heap. So the if to the uh the the comparator will help you define if it's a maximum heap or a minimum heap. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. And maybe now it could be a good point to continue and talk about tablecloth columns and then go back to a discussion if it is okay. Yes, I will stop my sharing. Um, okay, so I am, um, one thing I didn't uh, anticipate was that I was going to use both or two windows. Uh, so I'm going to try to, and I have this big monitor, which I'm still getting used to, especially for video conferences. Um, so I'm going to, but I'm going to try to use the whole thing and like increase font sizes. So I'm going to, let me share first and tell me if it, uh, how it looks. Is that readable? I can, you know, increase sizes and things. It would be good to zoom in, I think. Which side? Both. Both, okay. Thanks. Whoops, Whoops. I just messed things up here. Okay. Better? And this one is easy. Yeah, I can do that at will. Or is it too small? I can also switch back and forth or try to anyways. Well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so um, yeah, my comments are gonna be short, briefer and more disorganized. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, having listened to that previous presentation, um, uh, I'm super interested in the contrast between these two, what are basically uh, different approaches. I don't know. The question is how different. Um, I think there's some obvious differences, but but to like having a data frame uh, enclosure um, or data set, whatever you want to call it. In this case, it's called a data set. So, I'm what I'm. Uh, let me just show you the properties on uh, on the web. So I'm I'm working on a project contributing to a library called Tablecloth, which you can see here. Um, and uh, tablecloth, uh, which exists in a cyclose org namespace uh, or, or you know community organization on GitHub, is uh, is a is a library that um, 
is built on top of a whole stack, which we sometimes refer to as the tech stack. Um, uh, and it, so it, it's kind of like a, an, an, uh, as, you, as you go down the stack, you get, as is commonly the case, closer to the, you know, the, the metal of the, of the machine. And tablecloth is kind of the top in the sense that it's meant to be the easiest to use, um, uh, to have an API uh, that uh, aspires to be as beautiful as the one we just saw with Clojask. Um, and I think in many cases it is, is very beautiful. Um, uh, and underneath it is this library called TechML dataset. Um, and TechML dataset is a lower level library uh, built by uh, Chris Nuremberger. And the um, and it um, is this essentially the library that provides the data set type. Um, and most of the operations um, that are uh, operating on the data set. Uh, so that, you know, table structure. Um, and um, so tablecloth in many cases is not doing a lot of, uh, you know, the, the, the actual, you know, the functions that it, it including aren't necessarily doing that many much of the heavy lifting or the operations a lot of that stuff lives in techml data set and what tablecloth is doing is is um designing the interactive experience the api uh in a way that is um a little higher level and more consistent um and uh and then techml data set itself uh so if there's a link here um is built um it, the, it, so it's a you know table of columns, uh, and it's uh, and the columns um, are uh, built on top of or built using a thing called tech data type, uh, which um, is a even lower level. Uh, D type next, right? Sorry, D type next. Yeah, I, I, was, I get the it's the names have changed over time, um, and and D type next is. Um, providing uh, some lower level abstractions, especially the notion of an array or a buffer. It, it calls them a buffer. Uh, and, it, and, and you have reader buffers that are read only and, and writer and write buffers that where you can mutate them, which is a less common use case, but um, necessary. And then underneath it's, it, it works, uh, you know, I can't even describe it uh, very accurately uh, because it, it's you know more complicated and often not in my purview, but it it uh, is interacting with Java and managing the, the type system and um, does a whole lot of things uh, to that guarantee a certain kind of performance and efficiency. So you know the, this stack goes all the way down like that. Um, and and um, but you know at the level that we'll talk about today, it's just, you know, it's tablecloth and what we're working with are these data sets and the intention and some, the, the, the focus is on the, um, you know, the interactive, the API of, the, of how you interact with the data set. Um, so, um, yeah, let me, let me just show you just like a little bit of the API, just uh, nothing super extensive. Um, but uh, so I'm I'm using uh, on the left here. Uh, oops, I don't delete things. Um, you can see here tablecloth. Uh, the the project I'm working on is related to this this require statement or a column API. So that's what I'll uh, we'll talk about in a bit. <clears throat> um, and you'll notice here I've also this is dtype next, uh, and um, We'll I'll explain a bit why I've required those here, and then here I'm um, importing a tool that uh, um, Daniel here authored, uh, which helps to is just is a visual visualization tool, kind of like a notebook. It, you know, you can actually you can see it here on the right, show the results of uh, what you're evaluating in the buffer over here, um, in cases where it's helpful to have a have it displayed more in a more pretty way. Uh, so. Um, if I, for example, you know, just do evaluate this, it should show up here. 
All right, so that that's just the interact interaction you can expect. Um, so similarly to close ask, you can create a data set from in this case it's called data set from a data frame. So uh, um, this and TC here is the alias I've given for tablecloth. So um, we can create this um, pull in the data for uh, flights CSV, which is a list of flights for um, in the year 2013 from New York, I think. Um, and uh, you can display uh, the, yeah, the head. I'm not sure why that's not updating over here. Oh, there it is. It's taking for some time for a second for some reason. You know, I'm not going to restart this because there's a feeling I might have flooded it. Hopefully that helps. Um, there, it's more responsive. Yeah, so you can see. Um, some columns here, the year, month, day, there's a, each of these is a flight. Um, just, we're not gonna go deep into the data or anything. I'm just showing you uh, what, what we're dealing with there. Uh, and we can get info about it. Um, so this is, you know, giving us the descriptive statistics for that data set uh, for, not, for each column. Um, you know, the kinds of things you'd expect, number of missing um, min, mean mode, that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, yeah, operations like we were seeing with closure ask, um, um, let's see, uh, yeah. So in this case, uh, I was just, I just kind of gave like a full example of something. So we're, this is a visualization tool, but let's say we just want to group by the hour and then aggregate, um, by the number of flights. So, you know, counting the rows, uh, we could do that and we get, you know, uh, a number, um, a, a, a data set that shows that you know, it's grouped by the hour and then the count, this, these numbers of the, you know, number of rows in each. Um, when you, uh, uh, so one thing that Tablecloth does do, I don't know if I can show this well, is, um, it has a notion of a grouped data set um, versus, you know, it, which is an added concept that doesn't, I believe, exist in the data set. Um, yeah, so you can kind of see it on the, I'm wondering how this will show up. Yeah, okay, so you can see, uh, it doesn't show the data, but like there's these, um, these are, each of these is a data set. Um, you can kind of see it over here. Uh, so this is a grouped data set and, um, one of the things that tablecloth does for example is is has this ability to uh you know know whether or not it's dealing with a grouped data set and handle it smoothly and it often oftentimes hiding um uh information you know hiding the uh awareness of it from the from the user when they don't need to know about it um uh so i'm just trying to give you a sense of of uh of this uh, of tablecloth, it, it, but you know it, it's providing um, you know and, and like what specifically its aim is in terms of um, creating basically a nice interface. Um, uh, yeah, and then this yeah, I'm just this is just I just did this, so I'll show it. But this is a tool um, uh, that provides some very simple. It, it's very much in uh, in, in a test stage, uh, um, and uh, it provides uh, some simple visualization built on top of another visualization called Hanami. So we would just visualize that, the, those grouped sets like that. And, you know, this is, I guess the, um, uh, I, I put this here because I guess this is the, the kind of goal is to have a relatively simple um, and readable to, to create simple and readable expressions like this. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I guess a big part of, you know, you might notice is that is this kind of ability to use the pipe operator, the, the arrow to just, we just push the data through, um, you know, it, and these libraries are expecting that data set as the first argument, and it just uh, helps to make it readable. Uh, you know, when you can stop at each stage and see what you've got, 
and and um, and you know do kind of exploration um, that way. Um, um, yeah, I, that was all I was going to show, but I was kind of uh, I was trying to. Um, I wish Chris Nuremberger or, or somebody more knowledgeable than me was here about kind of like all the internal memory stuff of of TechML dataset and tech data type. But um, uh, one thing is, uh, I think that this that tech tech or sorry D type next and TechML dataset have the intention of being libraries that make it possible to operate on large amounts, relatively large amounts of data in memory. Um, and achieve that by, um, you know, a really smart use of, of, of memory, uh, which I think, uh, and that, that's kind of now we're talking about like what tech uh, D-Type Neck does, um, which I think is achieved in part by um, uh, insisting, by the fact that buffers are typed and have, and countable. So, they're all one kind of thing and that and what they are is managed and optimally and they're countable so you know they can uh the assign certain amount of memory uh that is known and and manage that memory efficiently uh and then also the 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 columns that make up the the dtype next provides and that make up techml data set um are lazy and not caching um so uh, that can create some complexity, but it it means that there that uh, you can kind of play around with the stuff in 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 the buffer with even relatively large amounts of data. And just, I mean, I don't know how to illustrate that so much, except that like here, oh, and and there, and also I think the uh, uh, and this might be an interesting comparison. Uh, it was one of the things I kind of wanted to ask more about, but. Uh, this whole stack is is optimized uh, uh, for column wise um, operations um, because the columns are uniformly typed. Uh, the fact if you can operate on on columns rather than rows, you're operating on uniform blocks, you know, of data types, and you can be more efficient. Whereas if you were to operate row wise. Um, it, it's you're dealing most cases with heterogeneous data. Um, so, um, for example, this is just an example of, a, I guess, a column wise operation where let's say we have, you know, two columns with some numbers. I, I just create a map and then I can convert that into a data set. And then there's this map columns function. Uh, and I think uh, uh, we were seeing a similar function in Clojask, uh, but uh, maybe it was, I forget what it was called not op move is operate um so here we'll create a new column z from x and y and we'll just you know add them together so rows is those rows i've specified uh uh here and then and uh and then um adding them uh so it's and that was on a million rows so it's kind of fast um um, uh, by the way, Ethan, uh, that yes. is fantastic. Uh, we need uh, this intro to tablecloth and it is so wonderful. We have 10 minutes to the official time mm -hmm. and maybe it would be good to, to maybe switch to the column story when comfortable. And then, so, so we could have a few minutes to, to conclude yes. Yeah, Thanks. So I was just getting to it. Um, uh, so right now, if you look at, uh, at what I was saying is, you know, this this kind of expression, we're piping the data set through the functions. Uh, so, and 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 that's right now what uh, what tablecloth handles. Um, uh, but and and you know, and it's fine. It works, you know, well. We can. This is just another example. Let, let's say we want to add another column where we calculate the night, the number of night flights, you know, and so. We'll add this column night flight, and then we can operate on one of the columns to generate. You know, so what in this case we'll ask is the is the is the departure time or the hour, uh, you know, after midnight and before six, um, and 
Uh, and so, you know, you can think in terms of columns, uh, in terms of modifying the data set, and that's fine. But what if, uh, and this, you know, one of the challenges of having with this project is kind of finding um, good uh, um, uh, use cases that are that one can show. But like, let's say you wanted to start, go down to the level of the column. Um, like working, if you're familiar with pump, um, NumPy with a NumPy uh, or with Python world data, if like working with a NumPy array. Um, and here, uh, so let's say we take the air time and, it, and here things, first of all, that none of the functions in tablecloth handle a column. And so essentially what I'm working on is, is um, an, a, a new API within the, um, within the uh, tablecloth world uh, you can see it here uh, that can handle columns rather than data sets in a similar similar way um, and uh, and there's some so this I'm just showing you kind of there's some really basic challenges uh, and it's kind of like what tablecloth has done for the data set where it's kind of smoothing over uh, things that exist on different levels of the uh, the tech stack and um, and and finding a, a uniform uh, way of expressing those things. Uh, so, and I'll just show you one I've been working on. So, let's say we take the air time, which is the time the plate was in the air, and it's um, uh, in the form of uh, numbers where um, the uh, you know where like. The, if it's three numbers, it's you know it's the hour and then the minute and the minute and then if it's four, it's you know the hour but longer, or, or you know ten a.m. on or whatever. Um, and then let's say we were curious, like okay, wait, but what is that data type? Because and like close uh, close us, we don't see that right away. Um, and so we we call the type function from closure, and that works. But it and it gives us some information, but that's not quite right because when we're in the tech data type uh, world of typing, and, and we have um, a set of keyword uh, types. So actually, tech data, and so I'm using a function from tech data type here, and it uh, it is giving me the data type of the elements, uh, and so it's. Uh, um, it's telling us it's an int 16 it's a concrete type but then we um this is like a arguably kind of a, the the fact that it's an int 16 as opposed to int 32 or int 64 is kind of a perhaps an implementation detail or something you don't need to be aware of for example if you're like in r right it would just tell you it's an integer or something like that <clears throat> um and so that's what we've started to do in tablecloth uh so we have this idea, uh, and this some of this is new, new stuff that we've been, I've been working on. That, um, you know that uh, that there's concrete types, which are the type type of thing that TechML data site works with. But in the tablecloth world, we might um, uh, have a more notion of a you know general types similar to R. So in this case, we can look at those. And so, so if, in, if it, an int sixteen is a is an integer and it's numerical, um, and um, and so then we can and this is part of the stuff I've been working on adding. We can we can find out what is the, um, you know, what are the types. And but at the the this new level in tablecloth, we would talk, we would try to normalize. The general type concept and and shield the user a bit from these concrete types like what specifically type of int is it partly because that's the kind of thing that techml data set is handling on its own it being smart about and the user doesn't really need to in many cases know about it um, and you know we can check whether it's an integer um, uh, or so what's the other one so like is this textual let's say i want to you know because you know, one way to Let's say we wanted to convert this column to uh, some sort of time. We might want to parse parse it from a, a string. So we might want to convert it to strings and put them in a certain format and parse them as time objects. Uh, it, it, but it's not textual yet. Um, so uh, and then you know here you uh, I was actually this doesn't work, but uh, I was trying to 
you know, okay, what would it look like to convert that? Um, and then, you know, you start to run into other oddities that are still there if you're working on this column level. Uh, um, there's um, a way, so in order to, let's say I want to convert this column to a string. Well, tablecloth has a convert, I think, types function. But again, this is expecting, if I don't, you probably can't see that on the very bottom, but it's expecting a data set of the first column. So the, the existing tablecloth API is, is working with data set. So, and if we want to work on a column level, well, then we have to drop back down to D type next level. So you can, you know, that's not optimal because um, we don't, we want tablecloth to be an easy to use library. Uh, advanced users may know already what D type next is and what tech ML data set is and all the functions that are available there, but we don't want them to have to have the awareness of all those different libraries. Um, uh, so, you know, finding a, creating a function to, to cast a column um, uh, it, you know, may be an important part of, you know, this process I'm following. Uh, um, you know, similarly, I can't call info on the airtime the way I, you know, on the column, maybe I want to just see the information about the column. Um, so yeah, I, this is the extent of my, uh, demonstration. And I, I just kind of wanted to show, uh, you know what I'm doing, and you know what, and and how I'm uh, trying to approach it, and at the same time illustrate a little bit what the uh, what tablecloth is and what our aspirations are in terms of the column API. Uh, so that's that's all I have for the moment. Beautiful, thank you so much for this, uh, and uh, you know uh, I think we haven't had those kinds of presentations of a brief intro intro to tablecloth so that is so useful uh, maybe except for your talk in the conference uh, about a year ago and mm. um, yeah and um, we are now just around the official time and probably a few people may need to leave uh, but uh, uh, we could uh, maybe have a few brief questions, comments, and uh, we could all try to be a bit, little bit brief uh, to make it kind of friendly to the, those who need to leave. And then those who could stay may like to stay and we could chat further. Is it, is it okay? Yeah, uh, so any, any comments or thoughts by anybody? Uh, I do have a question before Ethan, uh, the tablecloth. Um, so I see the one example you showed that uh, uh, you work, uh, I think a group by hours and then on the right hand side shows up the, the columns, you know, every element become a column hour, the, the map, right? Um, so I'm just wondering, so when you work on the columns, is it mutable or immutable? I mean, or you just have a, or is it immutable like enclosure, you have a new new things coming out of this? Uh Right, it's uh, it's a it's immutable. Oh, okay. So you you can um uh right there are cases when you're operating on large amounts of data where it's just more efficient to uh, to mutate. Um, and I'm actually not entirely sure about TechML data set, but underneath like but a. Uh, I, you, you may remember that I mentioned when I was talking briefly about T type next that it's buffers. There are two, it, it provides this abstraction of a buffer. Um, and, and buffers can be readable or writable. And if they're writable, they're mute, you can mutate them. Um, and so there are special pathways, at least in D type next, for you know, function pathways, API pathways for uh, mutating data. Um, and um, it's just that those are special pathways, and so then and and not and, and to be used in special cases. So the uh, you know where it's absolutely necessary. Uh, um, but other than that, uh, the the buffers are, are are readable only. And um, and uh, when you're operating with a data set, therefore uh, in TechML data set or in tablecloth, it's uh, there's no mutation. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so I have a quick question. Uh, so is my understanding correct that table class is basically like a sort of like a DSL where you use, uh, you know, input code as data and then uh, phrasing it to uh, different code for execution using macros? Uh, it, it's not all macros. There are some. Uh, uh, um, uh, but yeah, it's not most of the machinery is in most but not all not all of the machinery is in uh in you know the lower levels in tech ml data set and dtype next and and the and and then so what tablecloth is doing is any you know it's kind of this layer uh where uh the code is mostly about supporting you know a certain kind of interactive style uh, which is is the idea being it's higher level, easier, more consistent. Um, you know, some of that is TechML data set. Uh, you know, it's just it's kind of the <laughs> limitation. I, you know, I've, I've heard Chris Nuremberger say this that you know, like that the there was so much effort in put into the the lower level problems, the optimizations, et cetera, et cetera, that sometimes it was just hard to do the. <laughs> beautiful API thing at the same time. And I think that's tablecloth is picking up that role in a way that um, provides a more consistent, easy to use API and, and is at the same time consistent with the style of programming uh, implied by um, uh, DType Next and TechML data set. Um, you know, so the heavier, a lot, some of it is like, yeah, macro reorganization or functions that provide, you know, just change around the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the arguments and, you know, whatever, some of it's more involved, like group data set, you know, with some of the stuff I was time showing around the column, the problems I'm facing. Yeah. Sometimes it's just creating an alias, you know, that provides a nicer, uh, naming convention that's kind of consistent with what's in the other part of the tablecloth. Sometimes it's, uh, yeah, you know, like in the, the case of the typing, it's like, okay, this is a type function and it uses some functions in table, uh, in TechML data set, but we have this idea of a, a hierarchy of types, you know, the general to the uh, concrete, um, which is existing at the moment anyways on the tablecloth layer uh, only. Okay, great. Thank you. Really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And uh, since we are a little bit after the official time, maybe let us uh, think about what could happen next. Uh, uh, so it feels like there is a lot to ask and a lot to think about and maybe some co potential collaboration. And some of it uh, would possibly happen offline uh, on chat and email because a few of the relevant people are mostly there like Chris Nornberger of the uh, TechML dataset library and uh, Tomas Sule of the tablecloth library and so potentially we could start some conversation with them offline and uh, another thought could be to have a future session that would somehow continue this discussion in, in uh, video format. And maybe another project we could relate to is Guinea, which is a wrapper of Spark with some nice closure data frame API on top of Spark. And I was wondering, uh, you know, um, mostly uh, from the Clojask uh, maintainers and from Ethan, what you would think would be useful for you, for your work process, what kind of events or discussion or other form of collaboration you would find useful in the future. Oh, and may maybe, sorry, another comment is that these days there is a lot of effort on making things teachable on creating workshops and a certain future course on data science enclosure and uh, some uh, cookbook project and we could also consider that how these projects could be part of making things teachable if you find that useful
Yeah, so I think from from our side, um, so this is I think the the first time we were really kind of showing uh, Clojask um, in a you know like a on, on Zoom here now or maybe uh, later when it's uploaded uh, to YouTube. Uh, so basically, so far we've just kind of uh, you know worked on Clojask with the with the idea that you know what the kind of work that 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 we've been doing in you know finance and stock market and these kind of things so to you know to be useful for that um but um so so from our side we would be really curious to to hear um you know what are some kind of other use cases people have in mind or you know what kind of extensions uh, people would be interested in so that we can start working on those uh, those things as well so basically make it more useful for you know for for other people as well Uh, Ethan, uh, do, do you have any thoughts about how you would like to see future collaborations uh, around these? Yeah, I was just trying to think. Um, um, well, I think on one level, I, I think it would, and that's partly what this group's for, but I, I mean, uh, I'd like to hear more about Clojask also, maybe even like things that are in, you know, something more potentially like even what I did, like reflecting on some, does, you know, process of expanding, you know, just to kind of understand um, uh, how you're thinking through the design problems. Uh, that could be interesting. I think hearing about, uh, about other, you know, and getting more comparisons, um, learning about Jenny, you know, I, I've known about that for a while, but haven't had it it's an opportunity to to hear in detail about it. So, but, you know, just hearing about certainly about more libraries um, around this about it, it could also be interesting to hear to kind of have a more a, a deeper comparison of uh, Clojask and the tech stack uh, in terms of how things function, you know, at a lower level. Uh, uh, I was I just found myself very curious about several things, you know, like the, uh, I was interested in that, you know, the, what, how you show the printing was, which is so beautiful of the data frame. Uh, and then with the type there and then the fact, and then seeing that you could have two types, um, is interesting, uh, in, in, uh, D type next or, and therefore in tech ML data set, the column would take on the, op it would have an object type if the column was heterogeneous in its, um, you know, if there was integers and uh, strings, for example, uh, different things. Um, yeah, so I don't know, that's not very specific, but I think maybe just more discussion and more hearing about some of the some of the details of what people are thinking through and what what's, uh, what, you know, pieces that are missing in, in Clojask and how you're trying to fill them. Um, yeah, I think I would love to share it share all of those information with you uh maybe uh in in, a, in, the, in another meeting for example we can we can arrange uh some private meeting of uh of uh both team of us uh, and I, I like to share more detailed you know design uh information of clojess with you and i would also love to hear uh more um more you know philosophy of yours i think yes um there is quite um a few apis in common of clojest and and uh, the your table so i think yes we we definitely can uh, collaborate on those common parts yeah i was thinking that i really loved the the there was like the this resonance between the tablecloth API that Tomas has already set up and and what you have there, uh, I, I think yeah for that conversation it'd be so wonderful to get Tomas and Chris uh, with you guys in particular because you know they're the the people that really know <laughs> uh, the internals. Um, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I think that that would be great. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, because like um, you know, like I mean, we've been doing some uh, some other uh, projects uh, before before we started with Clojask. So, for example, what we did, uh, we we wrote a uh, library for backtesting of some investment strategies. So you can basically have like some kind of quantitative um, investing strategy, and then you can you can see how it would have performed historically in in the past. Uh, and so, and, and then we we were you know um, at that time we were already thinking okay like how can we make this uh, so that that it can can handle um, data sets that are larger than memory and how you know maybe we can we can kind of spin off uh, some of the ideas there um, and that's basically how Clojask uh, started and uh, but you know we're we're still you know we're still learning um, so you know we we haven't been doing this for you know uh, like whatever 10 20 years or whatever like lisp uh, in general you know so we're still relatively new to this as well um and so yeah so like we're, we're very open to you know ideas suggestion collaboration pretty much a, a, a everything yeah I, I was wondering like if a, if a session like this one with if especially if we could get chris you know, we're kind of like diving a bit more into some of the, you know, sort of comparison of the structures underneath uh, could really, uh, I wonder if there could be some like cross fertilization uh, yeah, in some interesting ways. Uh, sure. Yeah. I don't know what exactly. <laughs> yeah. And in, in fact, so the, the reason why I, was, why I was asking about this DSL, you know, like domain specific language and so on. So, uh, because I think what you guys are doing is pretty interesting, right? So that you take a um, like an existing library and you try to make it more approachable or make more usable, more user friendly, and so on. And so, so we, we I've been thinking about something similar for for Clojask as well. Um, so uh, there, there was like an, another uh, RA who was working on a this is a separate project, but basically he was looking into like you know DSLs for for data science and how we can maybe um, you know, kind of use the flexibility of the Clojure language to um, to kind of you know just just make it easier for people to to use um, whatever whatever they want to do in in terms of data science uh, without having to know all the details and how everything works under the hood. Um, so so th this is actually was was kind of like a another direction uh, I've been thinking about for for Clojask. Uh, and so I think the work that you are doing is is very very related um, conceptually, uh, in that sense. So, yeah. So you know, I mean, I I would be very very interested in um, you know, keep talking with you guys and seeing if we can learn things from each other and and improve our our projects. Yeah, that's interesting. It just made me think. I mean, I don't know. Again, I don't know what form it would take, but one of the things. One of the labors involved in, uh, the, in some ways, is is the hardest for what I'm trying to do. And it, you know, it's a, I have limited time, but it, it's uh, it, it, and the, and this is hardest, therefore, because it's most time consuming. Is is the studying of, well, primarily use cases. Uh, uh, you know, finding, you know, you kind of have a, like with the column thing, we kind of know we need it, but sometimes it's hard for this particular thing. It's one of the more challenging ones for finding specific use cases that really isolate the problem because oftentimes you can work with a data set. Um, uh, but, um, but also beyond that, um, like looking at the other ecosystems, you know, which are the, you know, the, like Python and, you know, studying how NumPy works like thinking about what what is good there, what can be better, what things that you know the characteristics of closure, you know, make it possible for us to improve on. Uh, uh, so yeah, one could think also of uh, sessions like that, maybe looking at libraries together. Uh, around some use case or something, you know, and seeing, th you know, thinking about that, the language. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know exactly how we would want, you know, stage it, but there's probably a way to come up with something interesting. I'm sure, you know, you look at anything with a bunch of informed, interested people and it becomes interesting, <laughs> you know, you find something, so. 
exactly. So, so I've been using a lot of R before, uh, also a bit of Python and so on. Um, and uh, so the, there's this uh, library, it's called data table in R. And uh, so uh, they basically, I mean, they, they have a few very, you know, very good ideas. So uh, one of them is that it's really fast. So they, they've written uh, uh, most of it in, in C. Uh, but I think another part is that they really make it e really easy to, um, basically the syntax that they use um, is, is, I mean, it gets a, some time to get used to, but once you kind of understand how it works, it's extremely easy to write relatively uh, complicated operations in, in a very, very short amount of code. So, so I think that's really uh, very, very useful. And um, um, yeah, so, so, I, so I, you know, maybe we can learn something from, from this approach, you know, how to, how to basically make it easier for, for the user to, to just kind of translate the ideas that they have in their head about what they want to do in terms of the, um, you know, in terms of the, the data science uh, work um, and, you know, manipulation of the data that they have, um, you know, basically how to translate those ideas into uh, into code, right? So they kind of make this this connection uh, as 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 short and as direct as as possible. So I think that that's that's one of the key things, right? And and that that would also help to um, you know to make it easier for uh, for newcomers who are new to maybe Clojure or maybe new to you know all these kind of different uh, libraries that we're working on um, would make it also easier for them to uh, to get started, right? And and kind of um, you know, because like when 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 you know when when you talk to some people and say, okay, like I'm using Clojure, you know, then many people they they uh, uh, I mean, it, you know, it's getting more well known, uh, of course, but uh, but 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 still, um, compared to R or Python, most people have heard about those uh, maybe more. Um, and so I think one one thing we we can uh, you know we we can we can think about um, maybe in more long term. Uh, is really how to make it, you know, how how to make it easier for people to to start using Clojure and and uh, all these libraries in in the context of data science. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I think um, uh, Thomas uh, Sula. I never get his last name right, but he's the you know the prim primary author of Tablecloth, and I I know that he he says it in the readme for the library. You know that he was uh inspired a great deal by R. Uh, and that's certainly also i mean various you know it, it it seems to often come up on 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 uh on zulip and in conversations and among data you know data science cyclos conversations those kinds of things uh and i know what i'm doing I'm I'm always what with this column thing. I always going back and forth between numpy, numpy and R and looking at the vectors, you know. And it's just such a funny um, tacking back and forth like that, right? It's an interest. It's it, it's a it really challenges you because they each have different strengths, and in some ways, you know, it, uh, they're totally different beasts. Uh, and and I and it. I find myself thinking um, that um, I my goal is to you know maintain that kind of ease of use you were talking about that direct contact like for you know that that direct translation and yet and then I and then beyond that I want to pull things from both um, and I can only imagine that if I looked at other one other languages like Julia or something <laughs> that I would feel there would be, you know, each new one you look at, there's more to, um, more to pull from. Uh, so, yeah, I would really be interested in looking at things together, just because it's so interesting and having other people's ref like reflection on it while you're looking at, you know, having other voices and not just your own, and it'd be really nice. Yeah, t totally agree. Daniel? Yeah, sorry. Uh, just a little uh, suggestion. Maybe it is a beautiful timing to stop the recording, to keep it kind of concise. And those who wish to stay could keep chatting just for a bit, maybe. Uh, is it good? Or any concluding remarks about this session to be recorded? 
Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So whoever sees this, um, you know, if you have any comments or suggestions or use cases or whatever, uh, you know, any kind of improvements in mind for, for Clojask, feel free to reach out to us. And um, that's, that's what we're looking for. Yeah. Thank you.